Good day, welcome to Great White Retro. I'm Gord Vesic, this is my dining room again, and our topic today is the IBM 5150. With the monitor working, we can now work on troubleshooting this computer. When we last left off, we had a busted cassette basic ROM, we had no way to hook up a keyboard, and really no way to start the computer even if we got all that working. Today, we've got some extra accessories to try to get all this done, and we're gonna see if we have time for a good old cleanup to get all this desert dust off of here. Let's get her done. So when we last looked at this, it was complaining about an FA00 code saying that one of these was not working. According to minus zero degrees, it is U31, which is right here, which, you know, makes sense because that's where that battery was dripping onto. Let's pull that off of there. Pins look okay, but I can see there's a bit of a mess in there. Try to brush that out and then use some deoxid on there. Yeah, that does not look the greatest. Yeah, the pins look a little corroded. Since U32 is right nearby in the same spot, let's take a quick look. Yeah, there's some problems there too. Get some of that crud out of there. Deoxid that socket. Let's get this reassembled and see what happens. All right, and I also picked up a PS2 to XT keyboard adapter to try to get this going. There's our picture. It's still complaining about the ROM being corrupted, but it's no longer complaining about the keyboard. Well, that's something, I suppose. Next step is to remove and replace those sockets around that ROM. The original IBM 5150 is pretty easy to take apart. I actually didn't even need to remove these floppy drives. I just did this so, just for convenience more than anything else. This is a pair of half-height drives. I'm pretty sure that these are aftermarket floppy drives because the 5150 didn't ship with half-height drives. I'm pretty sure these ones worked at one point, but we'll just get these out of here just so we have some room to work in this case. Next, we unhook the power connectors here, and we try to loosen these two screws. This motherboard only had two screws fastening the, the board to the case. Ah, the good old days of the XT and AT cases where they only had a couple screws and a bunch of plastic standoffs to hold the board in place. <laughs> After loosening these screws, I was able to use my socket to take these screws out. And then it just kind of slid out. I ended up keeping the plastic standoffs in there. I have to admit, I do prefer the modern ATX style of motherboards and cases where everything is screwed into place. We'll get those power connectors off, and remember the black ones? The black lines go in the middle when I go to reconnect those. Here's the back of the board. It looks in remarkable shape considering what this thing's gone through. So I plucked out all the EEPROMs, and I tried cleaning these sockets a little more. I still can't tell if it's the socket or if it's the chip that's corrupted. One way to find out is to try programming a replacement chip and it turns out that these same ones I've got for the Commodore 64 and the floppy drives are the same size and apparently the same adapters will work. What I don't know is which ones will go into where. Now it's U31 that's messed up, so I'll start with that, putting the others back. And 
hoping that this will fit. Hmm. Nothing's in the way. Maybe that's as far as these go. This EEPROM has all four of these images copied onto it twice. And maybe I just need to flip bits until I find the right one. Well, wish me luck. First, we'll try number one. I've got eight possibilities here. Two of them will work. At least I think two of them will work. Maybe none of them will work. Hmm. Oh, look at that! We've got basic! <laughs> and it only says uh, 64k free for some reason. Hmm. Well, okay, I guess we got lucky on that one. It was only the second try. Well, son of a gun. We've got basic. So now we know the ROM is corrupted, not the socket. Well, thank goodness for that. Good to know that these adapters that uh, I made for my Commodore machines will work. But I'm still puzzled as to why I'm only getting 64K available for basic. Well, this is where this will come in. This is an XT IDE that I got from Monotech. They have kindly supplied a pre-formatted and pre-installed uh, compact flash card here. Let's just stick this in the first available slot. I also got the jumpers confused. I thought maybe I had that this was SW1 and this was SW2. Nope, this is SW1 here. And this is the board that has that bizarre bug where you have to have all four of the round banks populated. Kind of disappointing. I was hoping to be able to remove the, all of this MT RAM and then just run it off of the uh, memory card that I got. But uh, let's let's try this first. Let's see if we actually have 256K. For some reason, it won't boot off of the C drive right away. I'll look up what that error is later but I found I was able to select it by hand. That worked. It does come up as the C drive. And interestingly, it comes up with 256K. So let's see, what version of DOS is this? Ooh, my goodness, they gave us the latest and greatest. Well, thanks, Monotech. I was worried about how I was going to end up formatting this thing. When I plugged this into my Windows 10 PC with a complex flash reader, I found it complained about a disk error. Hmm. Hopefully that's not a major problem. Oh, well, <laughs> hmm, we're going to do big to fit. In. Okay, anyway, if it's too big, Let's put the RAM expansion back on there. Let's tell this thing that it's got 64K and see if we can get scan disk working. All right, so now that we know we have 256K, we will tell the, tell the RAM card that we've got that. So we'll turn off the first four RAM banks. There we go. That should enable the rest of it. We'll leave these turned off. I want to try adding more than 640k once I get uh, the glab the, the GL BIOS or GLAB BIOS <laughs> on here. Okay, yeah, there's a line there. There we go. All right, 640. Let's see.
Oh, I wonder what it's complaining about. Let's see what more info says. Oh, the fat media bite is missing. Is that all? Okay. Let's see if it'll let me fix it. That might have been what Windows 10 was complaining about earlier. Wish I knew what it was doing. Oh. It still claimed to find some issues. Oh, and I don't have a keyboard for some reason. Lovely. Alright, it's no longer complaining about those first two parts. Alright, there's something funky going on with the RAM. I don't like it. This display is getting garbled up. I'm gonna check on this on Windows 10 now. Hopefully we don't have anything else wrong. As I do not trust this MT RAM on here, I'm going to try a few different BIOSes here. This is Rudd's Diagnostics. Okay, this was the one I was looking for. My understanding is that Rudd's Diagnostic can also check addressing errors. Oh, well, there's no floppy controller, so that's going to fail. Okay. I wonder why it's saying one of the ROMs still failed. Hmm. Oh, that's the very first socket. Yeah, there's nothing in there. Okay, I'm gonna leave this running for a while and we'll see how it behaves. Next, let's try out an ATI graphics solution. This is supposed to support uh, CGA mode graphics on a monochrome monitor. Nope, we don't even get a picture. Right. So after a lot of fiddling around, this was the best I could accomplish, at least with this screen. So I'm not sure what I can do with this, but I do have a plan B. Okay, so what you see here is an arcade converter board that you can get from Amazon. The good old GS or GBS A200. Yes, I know these things are not going to work out of the box. I do, however, have a cunning plan for addressing this. It involves making a composite sync signal, and some resistor ladders to convert the digital RGBI into analog RGB that this thing will be able to convert. So I will come back to that once that is built. This little circuit is adapted from a design from YouTube channel Raster Eye, and he has a quick circuit to convert horizontal and vertical sync to composite sync using an XNOR gate or also an XOR with an inverter, but I ended up ordering an XNOR chip for this purpose. Then I had to convert the RGB and intensity signals to analog RGB. Oddly enough, the GBS8200 just looks at analog signals even though it claims to be using CGA. And I used this resistor ladder with this diagram directly lifted off of rasterized network. So I did something very similar to this to adapt the signals for the GPS 8200. And we'll see what happens when we put this thing together. So this little contraption works like this. It plugs into power on the GBS board. This plugs into the CGA port. This plugs into the input lines on the GBS board. And hopefully the output from the GBS board will output to VGA. Okay. First things first, let's get a signal. Oh, hello, there's our Chinese characters. Now we try powering on our computer.
And we're not getting anything. Okay, well, this is different. Well, the difference between my last attempt and this one is that I forgot that this IC uses open collectors. And I didn't know what that really meant, but what that does mean is you can combine outputs to other ICs that are also open collector. But if you're using the output by itself, you need to use a pull-up resistor, and that's what that 10K resistor is sitting up there for. So now it's outputting a composite sync signal. This suggests to me that there's a problem with the video RAM on this ATI graphics solution. And it takes 4116's pretty standard uh, RAM, which I think we can find. We'll let this thing go through its tests just to see what the end result looks like. It looks like we've got a lot more troubleshooting to do, but we do appear to have a working uh, CGA to VGA converter at least. What I'm going to do is I'm going to test that on my Commodore 128. We'll see how well it works off of that. I got to put this thing back together and put the kitchen back together because right now there are parts all over the place. On the next episode, we'll try to troubleshoot this card. We'll see if we can fix the character glitches we got going on here. And we'll see if we can turn this thing into an early 1980s game machine. Until then, good day.